Hi everybody, today we're looking at a Bowens mount accessory. This is the Aperture Spotlight mount. It is basically an ellipsoidal lens system. It's uh, optically aligned for Aperture's uh, 300 and 120 family. Basically, stick the light on the back and uh, now you've got a highly controllable, highly focusable lens system. So have a look at that. Now in this video, we're gonna go through what this can do. We're gonna go through what's in the kit and then we'll do a comparison to, um, to an old school uh, Leco style light. So this is a uh, Celicon uh, zoom spot. And we'll also compare it to, to the Elite in terms of optics, which is the Dito light here. So this system here actually costs 1000 US dollars more than this. So it's gonna be a very interesting comparison. Now, before we get uh, any further into the video, I just want to point out that in the description down below, I'm going to have um, an index so you can skip sections if you wish, okay? Because if you know what you're doing, the next section is going to be a little bit boring. So uh, in this section, I'm just going to turn the light on and explain what this thing actually does because um, chances are you, you might not have seen one of these before. Okay, so we've got our light and we've got some lenses in here which focus the light into our chamber. And on this side of the chamber, we've got our barrel and into the barrel go our lenses. So you can get different diameter lenses. So this is a 36 degree lens, which is the widest that Aperture currently have. Um, they also have a 19 degree lens. I think it's a 26 degree lens and they're currently working on a 50, which I'll be buying as soon as they've got that ready. So you got your lens in your barrel and basically you move the lens in the barrel forwards and backwards to focus. Okay, so that changes your focal point. Okay, so let's talk about controlling the light, all right? So you're probably thinking, well, that's no worries, we'll just get a set of barn doors, stick them on the front, and hey presto. Well, that doesn't work. So you can see here the barn doors really do nothing, okay? And the reason the barn doors don't work is a focal point isn't here. A focal point is actually in the chamber. So if we want to control the light, we use these blades. So the light has four blades and basically they act like cutters, okay? Now, in an ellipsoidal system with everything bouncing around through the lenses, everything here is upside down and back to front. So if I push the top blade down, that'll actually bring up a cutter in the bottom of the, um, in the, bottom of the projection out there. So let's have a look. So that's our bottom, okay? Now, if I do the bottom one, that'll be the top. It's one of those few times where me being slightly dyslexic actually works pretty good. Okay, so the furthest cutter from me will actually be on this side, it'll be the opposite. So basically you get the idea of it. Now, um, the focal point we want to be there, so we just adjust that by using our lens here. Okay, so we can change the focal point um, from that point, we can go softer forwards or backwards, okay. Now that's just something I want to point out, uh, softer forwards to backwards is different. So um, every now and then you might be at just the right distance away from your wall that you get chromatic aberration. Okay, so chromatic aberration is uh, basically, you've got this lens which is, is, is magnifying the light waves to a 36 degree beam. Okay, and then when you get chromatic aberration, that's because instead of being magnified, the light waves are getting stretched. And when you stretch light waves, they change their color. So all ellipsoidals do have chromatic aberration or color fraying. It's just not as obvious in some lights as it is in others. Okay, this one's actually very, very good. It's got hardly any. Okay, so I can, uh, foc if I focus uh, forwards, um, you can get some, uh, a little bit of green on the, the edging. If I focus backwards, um, it actually becomes, it's blue. Blue's way less noticeable. So you know, you've really got to be looking for it to see it. So if you're defocusing your, your shapes and you're getting chromatic aberration, just try defocusing the other way. Okay, now let's, um, let's have a bit of fun with this unit. So let's uh, lock this off. Let's see how much control we have. So I'm gonna try and light one square on my garage wall. Okay, so. Okay, so look at the control you've got. Now, one thing I almost forgot to mention here is the, um, the blades do have some rotation in them, okay? But not a great deal. So uh, this is about the maximum uh, amount of rotation you can get out of them, okay? 
Now, um, that's a, pretty much the only disadvantage of this system is you can't rotate the barrel. So in these older units, you could quite literally rotate the barrel 360 degrees and, and put your cuts any way you want them. Okay, so our next slot along is our gobo holder. So uh, this thing uses um, size B uh, gobos. So you've literally got hundreds to choose from. Just uh, Google Roscoe Gobo size B and you'll literally see there are hundreds if not thousands to choose from. So you've got things from um, yeah, just, just random shapes to bars. Um, this, is, this is sort of my collection of things, circles. Um, you've got um, you know, uh, Venetian blinds, lots of different types of windows. So I don't want to show you um, Venetian blinds. So I think that's a bit, you know, a bit, bit drab and a bit boring. Um, I want to show you what this thing can sort of do. So I'm going to show you wavy lines. Okay, so you might think wavy lines, that's a bit odd. So let's stick them in. So one of the things I don't like with this unit is you've got to orientate the, um, the gobo, uh, the direction you want it when you drop it in. Whereas uh, this old unit, I could put it in and then rotate the barrel. I've got to make sure I get that exactly right. So that's, uh, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but you know, there you go. Now, at the moment, um, my focal point is for the blades. So the gobo is a little bit forward, so I'm going to have to change my focus just a little bit to get it sharp. Okay, so there we go. So wavy lines, right? It's a bit odd. Why would I want wavy lines? Well, here's the thing. You can defocus, all right? So let's have a look at defocusing. So I'm going to defocus forwards. Now, when you defocus forwards off a gobo, it tends to go really soft, okay? Now, I'll just get it back into focus and I'll defocus backwards. Now, here's the fun thing when you've got lots of linear lines or lots of shapes close together. When you defocus this way, the shapes tend to overlap when they go out of focus and you, get, you can get some funky uh, 3D effects going on. Okay, so I'm not sure if the camera's really showing that up, but you get some funky 3D effects. Now, what's cool with this is we've also got the cutter blades, okay? So we can use those as well. So let's put some slashes in. Okay, so we can get really creative with our slashings now. So we could have um, a slash of, of our, our wavy lines. I don't know why you'd want that. We can just have a slash that's um, a defocused mottled shape using those wavy lines out of focus. Or we could get funky and, um, and have it a little, bit, a little bit more creative like that. So um, your gobos, you might think they're a bit you know, contrived, but what you've got to remember is um, they can be great fun out of focus. Okay, so moving further down the unit here, we've got a uh, slot um, which opens up and it's a much broader slot and that is for your irises. So the iris is an optional extra. Um, I would suggest buying this. Just as an observation, it doesn't close down as much as uh, other irises I've had in the past. So you can't get as small a hole. So let's uh, drop this in and have a play with it. So you've got a stick that comes out the top so you can use that to adjust the, um, the size of your beam. So as you can see there, it gives you a lot of, um, a, a lot of adjustment on, on the diameter of your beam. So if you don't have a smaller, um, a smaller lens, uh, you can use this to compensate. So where I use these a, a heck of a lot is if I'm doing a job and they didn't tell me that they want a follow spot, I just find out on the day. So the iris comes in really handy for adjusting, um, adjusting your, your beam diameter on your talent. Now, in terms of using this um, as a follow spot, it's not what it's designed for, but uh, if you find yourself in that situation, this is actually quite easy to use because the stirrup is in the center. So it's very, very easy to get uh, smooth, smooth pans and smooth movements out of it. Now, the other reason I'd suggest um, buying the iris is, um, let's say we have a, a slash through uh, the center of our beam. Um, you, can use the, um, you can use the iris now to adjust the diameter of your beam. So that it's, um, it's a fast way of adjusting your beam diameters. Now, in terms of things I like about this iris, the uh, stick is quite well screwed in. So it's gonna lift out without coming off. So I've had a few um, other brands where um, I've gone to lift it and the sticks come off and then you spend the next 10 minutes trying to figure out how you're gonna get the iris out. But yeah, definitely worth, definitely worth getting. All right, so before we move on, I just wanna show you a little trick that I do with the iris. So if I'm using a gobo that's got uh, circular patterns in it, um, they go fantastic out of focus with the iris. So I'll just uh, drop that uh, pattern in so you can see it's basically just a whole stack of circles. 
Let's throw that uh, out of focus so we get some funky uh, 3D effect sort of going on there. Um, I can now use the iris to uh, reshape the size of that pattern. So it works really, really good, really funky with, uh, with circular, circular gobos and circular patterns. Okay, so continuing further down the barrel on uh, this side here, we have the uh, lock, which basically holds the lens in. So you undo that, focus it to where you want it, uh, tighten it up and that locks the lens in place. Now uh, moving uh, all the way to the end, we also have a uh, gel holder so you can uh, put some color in. Um, one thing I have noticed here that there are two slots at the end, so maybe you can buy a second gel holder or maybe Aperture's got some other accessories coming out. And the one thing I like ab about the gel holder is it has a spring lock. So, um, okay, that's pretty much uh, the unit. Hopefully I've whetted your appetite on it. Let's see what you get in the kit. All right, so let's talk about how much it costs and what you get for your money. All right, so this thing costs 500 US dollars. That's going to be roughly what it sells for. That's going to equate to about 800 to 850 Australian dollars. So that sounds like a lot. So just to put that in, into perspective, for 850 Australian dollars, you can buy this light, which is a Celicon zoom spot. So um, in a in a little while, we'll do a comparison of this to the Celicon zoom spot, so you can see. Um, what quality optics you're getting for your money here, because this, this is superior to that. So anyway, getting back to what you get for your money, so you get a properly constructed road case. So this isn't some cheap bag, it actually is a proper road case that will, it will protect your investment. Okay, so let's uh, have a look inside. Uh, the road case is all properly cut and properly fitted. So. You know, this is the real deal. This is gonna protect the, your investment um, for, for the lifetime of the product. What you basically get is you get the projection mount and you get a choice of a lens, so it comes with one lens. Just one thing I wanna point out here is the build quality on this is second to none. This is, um, it's, it's alloy construction, it's not plastic or fiberglass. I reckon if you're in your early 20s and you're starting to gear up, um, you'll be selling this when you retire. Okay, it is that well built, it'll last you until retirement. The other reason I think this is a really good long-term investment is there's nothing here that goes obsolete, okay? Your LED lights might change, you might end up with bicolor RGB, brighter lights, better color rendition, whatever. You just uh, clip those onto the back. So there's nothing here with built-in um, obsolescence. So it really is a good long-term investment. Now, also in the box, you get um, three gobos to get you started. Now, this is really, really good. I would suggest uh, have a play with these three gobos. So you've got a tree effect, uh, you've got a Venetian blind, and you've got a dapple pattern. That's, that's a good starting kit, okay? So I would suggest have a play with these, uh, have a play with them in and out of focus, have a play with your cutter blades. This, this little kit, will get you really familiar with what um, this unit can do, what it can do with the gobos. And that's really handy before you start spending money on more gobos, okay? Because once you open a gobo catalog from Roscoe, you're gonna freak out. There is literally hundreds to choose from. You, you know, it, it's fantastic. Now also in the kit, and this surprised me when I saw it, you get a cleaning, uh, a cleaning kit, which consists of a blower, a brush, a tool to undo the lens, a cleaning cloth, and also a suction cap so you can get the lens out without grubby fingerprints. Now, one other thing I like about the box is you will probably end up buying the additional um, iris. So basically, um, Aperture have already got a slot in the box where the iris can live. Okay, so let's compare it to other fixtures and see how it holds up. So I'm gonna compare it to a uh, Celicon zoom spot that's made by Philips, and I'm gonna compare it to a dado light um, a bit later on. So the reason I'm comparing it to these lights is, is these are the lights I happen to own. Um, so that, that's why. Now, just uh, in the interest of being fair, I just wanna point out that this is a zoom spot. So this is a 15 to 36 degree lens, whereas this is a fixed, uh, fixed focus or a fixed diameter lens at 36 degrees. So the reason I'm pointing that out is, is fixed lenses do have better optics than, um, than zoom spots, okay? So there is a slight difference. So it's like comparing cine lenses, comparing a, a prime lens to a, um, to a zoom lens. There's, there's, opti there's optical differences. So it, it is a little bit of an unfair comparison. 
But um, what I've got at the moment, I've got a uh, complex gobo projected on the wall there. So uh, let's go in uh, a little bit closer uh, with the camera and uh, have a look. Okay, so from a distance, they both look uh, pretty good, but uh, let's, uh, let's go in. And this is uh, center of the beam on the silicon. Now you can see there when I hold wide up, there's quite a bit of fringing or chromatic aberration going on there. Okay, so yeah, quite a bit. Now when you go to the edge of the beams, with um, it gets worse. Okay, and that's on uh, pretty much all ellipsoidals. So you can see there's quite a bit, quite a bit of chromatic aberration, quite a bit of color fraying going on there. Now from a distance, you can't see it. But when you're in close, you can see it. So let's compare that to um, com compare that to the yeah, the aperture. So on the edge of the beam, so this is about as worse uh, as you're going to get. So that's that's the worst I can find. Okay. Now if we go into the center of the beam, it's very very crisp, very very um, very very good. Now on the next comparison, I want to show you something that's really good with this unit, and that is the blades are very very close to the gobos. Okay. So they're very very close to the same focal plane. Whereas on your bigger units like these, there's a bit more of a gap. Okay, so probably about, I'd be guessing, or oh, maybe four to five times the distance. Whereas these are very, very close. So what I've done is I've put the gobo in and then closed up the blades. Okay, so as you can see here, the clear win is the aperture. Okay, for the next test, I'm gonna see if there's any stray optics, any, um, any uh, unwanted light uh, bouncing out of, the, uh, out of the lenses. So what I've done is I've set up a dado light and a C stand there, and I've got the silicon barreling in right between them. So what I'm gonna do is dial down our key light and see if there's any distinct shadows coming off this unit. So let's have a look. So as you can see, the dado light and the uh, C stand are casting distinct shadows on the wall. Now I'm gonna do exactly the same thing again, but this time with the aperture. Now, as I drop the levels down, the only shadows you can see from those stands and from that light are actually from the key light. Now, if I drop it all the way down to zero, you can see it's very clean. Okay, so now let's compare it to a, um, a a Dado light to DLED Turbo 7. So why am I comparing it to, to a, a Turbo 7 and not something bigger like a, like a 10 or a 12? Quite simply, I don't have a 10 or a 12. This is the biggest uh, Dado light I can afford. Um, now, a couple of things to point out. Um, this unit is ever so slightly green and this unit is ever so slightly pink. So that's why there's a cast difference between the two. Um, next thing I want to point out is this is running at 11% brightness. So to get an exposure match between the two, 11% brightness, this is running flat stick, okay? So um, this is a 90 watt bicolor engine, this is a 300 watt uh, monocolor engine. Um, now, the next thing I wanna point out is I'd expect this to be, um, to be sharper, so we're just comparing the optics here. Now, I'd expect this to be sharper for two reasons. One, it's a smaller light source, so it is literally uh, that big, and this one is that big, so the smaller light source should be sharper. And the second reason I expect it to be sharper and have better optics is because this unit, so the head, the projector mount, and the, um, the ballast control, is 1,000 US dollars more expensive than this. So it had better be, because I've got a heap of these, it had better be better. So uh, let's go out and uh, have a closer look uh, with the camera. Okay, so look, it's pretty clear that the, um, the Dido light is sharper, okay, and uh, it's got definitely got uh, um, blacker blacks. Now, um, I'm just gonna stand in front of the, the Dido light or the Dido light. Now, you have a look at my shadow. So see how sharp my shadow is? Then I step in front of the aperture and it's not as sharp. That's because the uh, Dado light is a smaller light source. So that's pretty much why it's sharper. So it is a bit of an unfair comparison there. Okay, so what we're really looking at is the quality of the, um, of the optics. So let's go in and have a look. So this is the, pretty much the center of the, uh, the Dado light. You can see there is a little bit of aberration there. Not, not, uh, not a lot, but there is a faint bit. So you can see a bit of green and a, and a bit of pink. And let's have a look at the top of the beam. It's pretty much the same. Now what's interesting is you can actually see dust, um, dust on the gobo, so that's how sharp the optics are on it. But pretty much throughout the beam, it's pretty much uh, identical amount of, um, of chromatic aberration or fraying, color fraying. 
So let's go now over to the aperture center of the beam and have a look. Um, it actually looks like it's got less. Um, gee, it's really hard to see any at all in the center of the beam. That's, that's really surprising. Um, the blacks aren't as black as, let's go over here. The blacks aren't as black as on the Dido, but you can see there the color frame and on the aperture, um, very minimal. It's there, but very, very minimal. However, at the top of the beam, um, towards the edge of the beam, there, there, is, there is a bit more. But it looks surprisingly, um, surprisingly good. Um, again, that's sharper because it's a smaller light source, but uh, having a look at the optical differences, I don't see that as being 1,000 US dollars better. Um, that's pretty good. So just one thing I want to point out, so this has got a 36 degree um, lens on it and the, um, the Celicon had a 35 degree lens on it. And I'm currently about four meters away from the wall. And I, I don't have any data to back this up, but my feeling from using uh, you know, um, ellipsoidals over the years is that's too close for a 36 degree lens to be you know, in its optical sweetness. Um, basically, I think, uh, if you project further away than that, you know, if the wall was further away, there'd be less chromatic aberration. So uh, what I did earlier is I just opened up the garage door and pointed this um, uh, just outside. And um, as you can see, projecting further away, it's, it's way more evenness of shadow right across the beam. And uh, just for giggles, I also decided to point it at the neighbor's house and um, drop a, um, a dappled light effect onto it just to show you what the firepower of this thing can do. Okay, so let's bring this video to a close. Um, I'll give you a little bit of technical data. So at three meters, this setup was uh, spitting out 4,240 lux. So to put that into real world uh, comparisons, um, that's about a 575 HMI par with um, the middle lens in. So um, yeah, so it's bright enough that you can actually use it in a daylight location. Now, um, negatives with this system, um, the one big negative is you can't rotate the barrel. Okay, so for me that's, I'm surprised how often I go to do that. For me that's a bit of a negative. The other negative is that because it's made for cobs, you can't flood spot. So you can't uh, have a gobo, for example, and spot up the center so the center's brighter than the outsides. You are basically your fixed brightness across the beam. Um, they're pretty much the only two negatives. Um, everything else about it's fantastic. Now, I've been looking for a daylight ellipsoidal solution for quite some time and I looked at HMI options and I didn't really like the optics. When I looked at LED solutions in terms of stage light solutions, um, by the time you find something that is um, flicker free, uh, this level of brightness, high color rendition and has actual manual control, not just DMX control, I was looking at about 8,000 Australian dollars. Now this whole system comes in at about 2,600 Australian dollars. That's the mount and the light, okay? And the advantage there is for my, you know, not just the fact that it's cheaper, but I've also got the versatility that I can do other things with it. So for me, this is, um, this is definitely a bit of a game changer. Um, so look, I, I really like it. Um, I'm gonna have uh, this in my kit. Um, and if there's enough demand, I'll buy a second one because at this price point, I can realistically afford to buy a second one. I know I'm gonna get my money back on it somewhere down the track, whereas if I'm spending $8,000 on a, on a, a top-end theatrical light or $10,000 on a, on a dado system, there is no way I'm gonna get my money back. So, look, I, I really love it, and I think this is a game changer for me as well in terms of how I look at Aperture. Um, sorry, Aperture, but Pretty much up until this point, I've looked at your 300D and your 300D Mark II and all your accessories and gone, yeah, pseudo-professional. This thing is top-end professional. So this has changed my outlook on, on Aperture product. Um, this really is top-end quality. I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear. Okay, so one last quick hack of mine. This is why I think you should get a gobo that's all circles. So if you have a look here, the outside ones are, are sharp and in focus and the inside ones are not focused and they're not evenly spaced. So the outside ones are spaced further apart, the circles, than the inside ones. 
So that tells me that I am too close to the wall to try to do any precision optics with this lens. So, you know, I'm on the wrong lens basically, I'm too close. Now if I go to a wall that's uh, further away and get that in focus, now um, you can see that's it's even focus um, amongst all the circles there on the wall, but if you have a really close look, you can see the spacing still isn't even. They're, they're, they're still um, closer together in the center than they are on the outside. So that tells me that I'm still a little too close to be using this lens if I want absolute perfect optical control. Now if I go uh, further away, Still, now this isn't um, an, an even surface, so it's a, a little bit of a, a crap thing to show, but uh, basically uh, all of my circles um, are evenly, evenly focused and um, evenly spaced apart, which tells me that I'm now getting uh, to the optical sweet distance for this lens.